I will say it again. I'm Yvonne Porterfield. Good morning. (laughs) We're reading from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Pray that we would hear it this morning, uh, but that we wouldn't just hear it, but that it would take root in each and every one of us, and that as we go from here, that we would be able to be doers of your word, that we would be able to live out this call and this challenge that Paul is giving before us. So speak to us this morning, Lord. Amen. Go ahead and grab a seat. So just a reminder for all of you, uh, maybe some of you have missed other parts of this series. We are in the middle of this series called Resilient Joy, going through the book of Philippians, which is a letter in the New Testament. Uh, And it's a fairly short letter in the New Testament. And much of the New Testament is comprised of letters like this. They're letters written to a group of people, mostly churches, Uh, who are trying to figure out how do we be churches uh, under this new person who died, who was God, Jesus Christ. These are like the first churches trying to figure it out, okay? And most of the New Testament, or much of the New Testament, is Paul, the author of this letter, writing to these churches, sometimes giving advice, sometimes saying hi, uh, and sometimes addressing problems, that the early church had. Go figure, the early church, this group of sinful human beings, just like us, had problems trying to figure out how to do it. And one of the reasons we, we, we still read the New Testament, one of the reasons the letters are often what are preached on in churches is the same problems that they had back in those days are a lot of the same problems we have today, okay? Just because we have 2,000 years to look back on, we get the whole of Scripture and they didn't have it just because of all this. We, we could learn from their mistakes, but we're human beings just like them. We mess up. And sometimes we need to remember what Paul said to those churches and take some of his advice. So we called the series Resilient Joy because uh, Paul, even though he wrote this letter to the Philippian church from prison, for some reason, this guy had just a joy that surpassed any circumstance, and the whole letter is permeated with this theme of joy. And so in the midst of this, joy comes out, and we're going to see that a little bit in this passage. And what we're going to see is that the Philippian church struggled with disunity, okay? Uh, and the way Paul describes it, they struggled with, with people looking out for themselves, 
They struggled with people striving for their own goals and their own glory rather than the collective uh, group effort to give glory to Christ. And Paul calls them out on it and he calls them to unity and specifically he calls them to humility. And so we can only assume because Paul, I mean, this, this letter is only four chapters long, okay? He didn't add the chapters, we added them later. It's a very short letter. And he devotes a chunk of time to it, to this disunity in the church. And so we can only assume it was a problem there. And it was a problem that needed to be addressed. And that's what Paul's trying to do. And so what we're going to do, it's 11 verses, verses 1 through 11 in chapter 2. It is packed with good theology. If you only knew this part of scripture, you'd be doing pretty well for yourself. Uh, But we're going to go through it verse by verse. We're going to do it one at a time. We're going to take it, see what it says, and see if we can't implement some of these things. And so we start in verse 1, as Yvonne just read. It says, Therefore... If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, usually when there's a therefore at the beginning of something, it's it's, it's good to look at what happened previously because he's building on that. And what we see is that previously, uh, this is where Troy, part of what Troy preached on last week is in chapter one, verse 27, he encourages them. He says, whatever happens, Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. They were not doing this. He is going to give some encouragement on how to do that. And he starts with these four if statements. You'll see here in the first thing. Therefore, and there's four things he says. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, okay? You're united with Christ. If this encourages you, if this is what spurs you on, If you have any comfort from his love, if you have any common sharing in the spirit, if you have any tenderness and compassion, nobody's going to say no to these ifs, okay? They are a church. They are striving to follow Jesus. I would hope we have these things. We would say, I am encouraged by being united with Christ. I do have comfort in his love. I have a common sharing in the spirit. I have tenderness and compassion. And he is a good, uh, he uses the thing, the next statement or the next verse goes then. My if statement, if you have these things, if you are these things, then... Verse two, make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. If you have these things, if these are the things that mark you as believers, then, like a proud parent, make my joy complete by being united, okay? Make my joy complete by being like-minded. That's not saying we all agree on everything, but being like-minded in what the goal is having the same love, being one spirit and one mind. If you have these things, be like this, not like this. Verses three and four. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. If you have these things, you should be united. Be united. Do not be these things. Do not uh, be selfish. Do not be conceited. Do not value yourself above others. Do not look to your interests above interests of others. You see, Paul tells them you should be united. Do not be these things which would encourage disunity, okay? A group of a bunch of selfish people trying to do their own thing, looking out for themselves. That is not what he wants the early church to be, okay? Pretty straightforward so far, all right? If you have these things, if you're encouraged by Christ, all right, be united. Don't be selfish, all right? Pretty simple. Uh, And one of the things that marks his call for them not to be selfish is this call for humility, The first time I heard the word humble was from a, I watched the movie from a book. Uh, any of you remember Charlotte's Web? Any of Charlotte's Web, it's, they, they, it was an old, they, it was a book, but then they made an animated movie, which is what I watched. And then they also did, they did, I think they did a in-person remake or like a live version of it, which they do to every movie nowadays. And in this book or in this movie, there is this relationship between a pig and a spider, and the spider's name is Charlotte. And what Charlotte does is she writes things in her web, 
okay? She writes things in her web that describe this pig. And people read it and they go, wow, look, I mean, this pig is these things. And one of the words she writes is humble. And me being a five or six-year-old watching this movie, I had no clue what that meant. I had no idea why being a humble pig was a good thing, why people saw this and they thought it was good. And so just in case, not to, not to leave any of you out, in case you are like me and didn't know what humble meant, let's have a common definition for humility that we can operate on. Uh, I'm stealing this from a book by a guy named John Dixon, uh, who wrote a book called Humilitas, which is a fancy way of just saying humility. Uh, and so he said, he, he phrased it like this, humility is the noble choice to forego your status, okay? To set aside your status, deploy your resources, or use your influence for the good of others before yourself. The noble choice to forego your status, deploy your resources, or use your influence for the good of others before yourself. I'm saying this at the beginning because sometimes we, we mistake humility for like a false, like, oh, no, no, I'm not that good. Like it's this it, it, false modesty, okay? That's not humility, okay? And that's not the humility Paul's calling them to. That's not the humility that I believe we'll see in the example of Jesus. And so Paul is telling them, again, just to recap, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, if you are united in Christ, if you share this common understanding, you should be united, you should be like-minded, you should have the same love, and you should not be pursuing selfish ambition. You should not be desiring personal prestige, and you should not be concentrating on yourself. Whereas being of one mind, being, having the same love uh, and the same spirit, those encourage unity, these things again, encourage disunity, okay? Be like this, not like this. And so then Paul is gonna keep going in this passage and expand on this, okay? What does this look like? All right, thank you, Paul. Be humble, got it. What does this look like in real life? And what he does is he points to the example of Jesus Christ, on what this, this, this life marked by humility, what this life marked by not selfish ambition, but pursuing the, the ambitions and the goals and the purposes of God, what does that look like? And so he starts that in verse five. He says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. He's going to tell them, what does it look like to be humble? What does it look like to be united? How do you live this out? Imitate Jesus end of sermon. Go home, be like Jesus. And then he goes on to expand in verses 6 through 11. Now, I said this before, verses 6 through 11 form a part of scripture that I, I think are so rich that if you read them quickly, you will miss what Paul is actually saying. Many believe that verses 6 through 11 actually were a, a hymn or a song that would have been sung in those days. This is something that the early church latched onto. We are going to sing this together. And I want to make sure we understand this. And again, I want to make sure we don't just understand it with our minds, but we are able to go home and be different in some way. Verses six through 11. So it starts in verse six. It says, well, verse five again, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. A couple things here. Right off the bat in this hymn, he is making the statement that Jesus is God. All right? Jesus being in very nature God, in his essence, in his being, this thing that cannot be taken away from him. This is who he was. And so if we think back to that idea of what humility is, if humility is foregoing your status or setting aside your status, right off the bat, he is saying that whatever you think your status is, Jesus has a higher status. In fact, he has the highest status. And so for Jesus to set that aside, that's going to be an incredibly big deal. And he goes on to say, he did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. What does that even mean? You see, back in the beginning of the Bible, you have a story uh, of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve are told there is this, this tree, there is this knowledge of good and evil, and they are tempted by the serpent saying, it, it'll make you like God. 
And what do they do? They want that for themselves. And they take it for themselves. And in direct contrast to that, what we see Jesus did is Jesus had it. He had that power. He had that knowledge. And what does he do? He sets it aside, not to bring himself glory. He puts it aside for a purpose that is bigger than that. He does literally the opposite of what our early parents did. Remember, humility is the noble choice to forego your status, deploy your resources, or use your influence for the good of others. He was God, which means he set aside the greatest status that any, any one of us could ever imagine. Verse 7. He didn't use it to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. This is a concept in theology we call kenosis, which comes from the Greek word, which just means to empty oneself, okay? You can think of it as like a, like a jar or a vase or a vessel, something containing something, and, and what this means is he emptied himself to pour himself out, okay? To empty that vessel. Uh, and, and again, I want to stress, if you read these quickly, it's easy to just jump past and think, okay, cool, he emptied himself, got it. But, but I want you to see how, how this flies so much in direct contrast to what we see as valuable and what our culture, even nowadays, still, still goes for. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been in a bookstore recently. They still exist. But there, there's often a section, a self-help section, Okay. And it's, it's, a, it's growing. It's a growing section, okay? People want to figure out, and my paraphrasing of the self-help section is, how do I be the best me I can be, okay? How do you live out your true purpose and be the best for me, DJ, that I can be? And what we see is that in, in Jesus' example, it, it weirdly, even though he's Jesus, what we see is it's not about being the best he can be, but he's, he's literally emptying himself, and this is different than like the Eastern idea of meditation where you're trying to empty your mind. He is emptying himself of his status. He's emptying himself of his desires. He's emptying himself of his own reputation of pursuing his own goals. All of those things that Paul says that the Philippians should not be doing, we see, Paul, we see Jesus ridding himself of these things as a prime example. One, one friend of mine, and this is from my home church, we, we talked about this idea of emptying oneself. And the kind of joke was, every now and then we would get up and talk in front of church like this, okay? Um, it's, it's very nerve-wracking, and, and let me tell you, it is great when someone comes up and goes, man, you did such a good job. It feels good, it does. But what he said is, is if we're truly trying to put the focus on God, if we're truly trying to preach God and it's God's honor that matters, then we shouldn't, that's not a good comment. You did a good job up there. No, it should, he, he, he made the joke, he goes, wouldn't it be better if someone said, man, you were such an empty vessel up there. <laughs> Nobody's ever said that. Please don't say this to me afterwards. But <laughs> the, the idea is this, you, it, it wasn't you that was up there, but you, me, everything in me got out of the way so that God's spirit could speak more free, freely through me. And that's the idea. So the idea is, it's not about you being the best you you can be. It's actually, weirdly, it's about you and I getting out of the way so that what is most clearly seen in our lives, what people experience when they interact with us, is actually they experience Jesus. What we're going to see is verses 10, uh, 9, 10, and 11, the goal of the Christian life, the, the entire end purpose of our being, and I've said this so many times before in other sermons, the entire goal is to bring glory and honor to God. And in many sense, we, any, any focus we take off of that uh, hinders that goal. And we are to operate almost like a reflection. When people see us, they're reflected directly to God rather than ourselves. And so what we see here again in verse 7, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Jesus emptied himself. Verse 8, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. I want to give us a quick history lesson because, again, 
we have 2,000 years of tradition, of symbols, of all these things, and, and sometimes the meaning, the original meaning of things gets lost on us. You see, when Jesus lived and, and before Jesus, uh, it, it wasn't quite the same culture as ours. Uh, one of the things to wrap your head around, especially American culture, is, is back then it was less uh, about, you know, what we would say is living an honorable life. Like, they lived in a very honor and shame culture back then, but what brought honor and shame were very different than what we might imagine, okay? Aristotle, in the third century, uh, made the comment. He said, honor and reputation are among the pleasantest things, one of your goals in life, the way you sought to live a good life and an, uh, uh, was, was to bring honor to yourself and to your family. You did that by dying a noble death in battle. You did that by behaving in a certain way so that people saw you and your reputation was increased. In, in, to give you an example, so in that time, if there was a Roman uh, couple, a husband and a wife, and let's say the wife committed adultery, there would be there would be a broken heart for sure. There would be a, a, a level of, um, this, there was betrayal and, and love, uh, this, this contract of love was broken. But one of the biggest problems with that for this husband is that this wife would have brought shame to her husband. And that would have been a bigger deal than the personal betrayal that happened, is that this act would have brought shame to the family and brought shame to herself and shame was to be avoided at all costs. There is, uh, just to, to keep hitting on this point, there was this thing in the 6th century BC, so this is before Jesus Christ, called the Delphic Canon, and this is for the, from the ancient Greeks. And what they did is there was this list of 147 things of what it means to live an ethical and a good life. 147. And on the list are things like control yourself, don't curse your sons, don't mock the dead, don't let your reputation go, respect the elder. 147, and nowhere on this list is humility to be found. Humility was not seen as a good trait. Lowering yourself, lowering your status was seen as, as something that was shameful. You were, to build, you were to gain honor for your family. You were to build your reputation, and anything that took away from that was something to be avoided at all costs. Honor was a sign of merit. It was a sign that you did something good. And John Dixon, in his book, he says it like this. He says, honor was the proof of merit and shame was the proof of worthlessness. And back in those days, one of the most shameful ways to die was to be crucified. They, they had three forms of capital punishment. You were crucified, you were beheaded, or you were burned alive. And crucifixion was seen to be as the most shameful and the most brutal of those deaths. And so you have Jesus come along, who is, as we said, the highest status in the, you know, that we could ever even think of. And it's higher than you can even think. And what we see is not only did he lower himself to the status of a human being and a servant, but he died the most shameful death imaginable at the time. And for many people, the fact that he died this shameful death was proof that he could not be God. But John Dixon goes on to say this. He says, but what does this say about the crucified Jesus? That was the question for the early Christians. What does this crucifixion mean for Jesus? He says, logically, they had two options. First option, either Jesus was not as great as they had first thought, and his crucifixion was evidence of that. Or the second option, the idea of greatness itself had to be redefined. You see, in history, up until the point of Jesus, it was honor, pursue honor and avoid shame. And in Jesus, you have an undeniable shift to where we see this idea of gentleness, of lowliness, of lowering yourself, of serving others to be seen as something that is good and to be desired. I think if you were making a list today of, of ways to live an ethical life, even if you only had five on that list, I guarantee humility would be on many of your lists. We see it as a positive trait. We see it as something to be desired and something to pursue. And, and what I'm trying to tell you is that by them singing this, the fact that they were singing God and cross in the same song would have been unheard of, totally bizarre, does not make any sense at all. 
And because for us, we see, we see Jesus hanging on the cross. We talk about it all the time. Um, you, people wear crosses around their neck. Um, we have totally changed the meaning of the cross and crucifixion and adjusted it. And so when we read something like this, if we don't understand what it was like back in those days, we can miss the significance of Jesus' death on the cross. John Dixon keeps going to say this regarding Jesus' crucifixion. He says, Honor has been redefined. Greatness has been recast. If the greatest man we have ever known chose to forego his status for the good of others, then greatness must consist in humble service. The shameful place is now a place of honor. The low point is now a high point. what does God do as Jesus goes from the highest place to the lowest place? It says, therefore, in verse 9, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Weirdly, in the kingdom economy of things, up seems to be down. Shame seems to bring honor. The low seem to be raised up. And that is why it's often called a backwards or an upside down kingdom. When commentary said, the divine economy of things by giving a person receives, by serving they are served, by losing their life they find it, by dying they live, and by humbling themselves they are exalted. Verses 10 and 11. Why, what is the purpose for all this? That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Two months ago now, I preached from the book of John, on John 17, and I showed you a graphic because I preached on literally glory and unity, and this feels like a part two of this. And I use this graphic um, that when we are united in our purpose, when we are united in bringing God glory, God's glory is magnified. And when God's glory is magnified among the people, we are again more and more united. It is, it is the cyclical thing that if the church is behaving with one mind, as Paul says, and one spirit, with one mission, and they are encouraged by Christ's love, then unity will only increase. And if unity increases, then the ultimate purpose again of bringing God the glory, not to ourselves, but focus on God, is also increased. As opposed to those things that... Paul said in in the first few verses, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but to the interests of others, we see in direct contrast to that, that Jesus' life was marked by obedience. Not his own selfish ambition, but the ambition of God. He listened. God's purposes were his purposes. His life was marked by humility, where he considered others. And his life was marked by self renunciation. It was not his own personal prestige he's, he sought, uh, but it is something he set aside. And so I said earlier that Paul is calling people here to imitate Christ. I don't believe it's enough to know this, okay? Uh, I don't believe it's enough if, if we sit here, even if you're such a good note taker, and I see some of you taking notes and I appreciate it, but I, I'm telling you, I, I don't think the best of notes are actually going to change you. I don't think the best sermon in the world, you could go home and if you don't do anything differently, what does it matter? And and what I wanna wanna say is I I fully believe, and I think this is backed by personal experience. I mean, how many of you have, have done a lot of research and go, this is how I can lose weight this season, but doing it is completely different and then you fail at it because it was too hard even though you knew everything you were supposed to do. Our experience tells us knowledge is not enough. The Bible calls, calls us out. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Uh, and, and popular psychology even nowadays, I don't know how many of you are into all these like habit books that are out nowadays about changing your habits and shifting. You can change your mind, okay? Your mind is, is plastic. It can adjust. You can build new grooves in it and build new habits. But the thing is, reading the book that tells you how to change your habits doesn't do anything to actually change your habits. You have to do something. And it is going to be hard because it goes against all of those selfish desires that we have. You need to do something differently. You need to incorporate a practice. If you are called to be obedient, you are called to be humble, you are called to renounce yourself and focus on others, what do I do with that? And so I wanna give you some ideas. 
for you to do. This is not an exhaustive list. These are just some examples to help prime this process, okay? Let's think about this. Uh, we'll take those three pieces, obedience, humility, and self-renunciation. Let's start with obedience. Uh, do any of you remember these uh, bracelets? Um, they, they were hot, like in the late 90s. Um, and they kind of became a joke. WWJD bracelet, uh, it just stands for what would Jesus do? Okay, Troy, our youth director, actually had one on, I think, when he started. He's trying to bring them back. Let's get it trending. Hashtag WWJD. Um, the idea of this, though, is that you would go about your day, uh, and, and when you encounter situations, when you encounter a friend, when you encounter a tough circumstance, when you, when you go about your life, this bracelet was to serve as a reminder that when I, am in, when I am responding, when I am doing something, what would Jesus do in this situation? How in this interaction can I imitate Jesus? Do I respond with, with, with impatience and anger or do I respond with love and compassion? Do I respond by overpowering this person or do I humble myself and lower myself? What would Jesus do in this situation? You're gonna go, that sounds so dumb and I'm not gonna do that. That wouldn't actually change everything. And I'm telling you, in these books that talk about changing your habits, changing the way you think, it starts by often just asking a different question. What if it's not about me in this situation, how I can look good, but what would Jesus do? Would he, would he bring honor and glory to himself? Probably not. He would probably give it to the other person. Another example. This is an idea of humility. Now, this, remember, this idea of humility is lowering yourself, of thinking others before yourself, of foregoing your status. And, and the example I want to give is an easy one. Uh, and it just has to do with, with your interactions with other people, okay? How you have conversations. I, I, I think before we go about thinking we're going to be martyrs of the church, you know, and sacrifice everything, let's start with how we talk with one another. Let's do baby steps here. Uh, and I'm going to use my wife uh, and actually my sister-in-law as an example here. Um, I, here's a confession too. In conversations with people, sometimes I'm just waiting for them to finish, to finish talking. I've done it. Or sometimes I, I'm not really listening. I'm just planning out what I'm going to say uh, so that I can sound interesting, so that other people can leave the conversation going, man, he knows a lot of stuff. That guy's really, yeah, what, a, what an awesome dude. Nobody's ever left a conversation thinking that. But sometimes in conversations, what I'm thinking, without even realizing it, is I'm thinking about myself. I'm thinking about how I come off to the other person. I'm thinking about what I'm going to say. I'm thinking about how interesting I sound. And again, she's, not, she's sick today. And so she's not here, so she'd be hanging her head, not looking at me right now. My wife, Sam... She's a therapist because she was good at this, okay? People in line at, like, stores would start telling them, start telling her their life story. Uh, they, they would. They would open up to her in ways that people have never opened up to me. And, and she would do this thing, almost like to a fault, where she would just keep asking questions. She would keep asking follow-up questions. Tell me more. That's interesting. What about this? And, and they'd just talk and talk and talk and talk. And, and I'd have to like break her away from some of these conversations. My sister-in-law does the same thing. You could be talking about the dullest subject in the world. And I, I did this because I tutored her in math one time. And, and she would look at me and go, man, this is so interesting. You are so good at, at, at describing these. Tell me more about this. And I'm like, yeah, I am good at saying these things. I'm such a good teacher. <laughs> you don't have to be interesting in a conversation. Just be interested you can humble yourself in a conversation by being more focused on how the other person feels, by, being, by, by listening more than you speak, God forbid, by just taking a step and going, in this interaction, it's not about how I come off. I wanna make sure that they feel heard. I wanna make sure they feel welcomed. I wanna make sure that they feel seen. And it's not as easy as it sounds. C.S. Lewis hits on this same idea uh, in one of his chapters of Mere Christianity. And he says something like this. He, he says, do not imagine that if you meet a really humble person that they will be what most people call humble nowadays. They will not be a, a sort of greasy, smarmy person who's always telling you, of course, that they are nobody. Probably all you will think about them is that they seemed cheerful, intelligent, and they took a real interest in what you said to them. 
You will not, they will not be thinking about humility. They will not be thinking about themselves at all. He's often paraphrased by saying, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. It's about thinking of the other person, putting their needs and their wants and their pains ahead of yours, if even for a moment in a conversation. The third piece that we can try uh, is this idea of self-renunciation. So this one's a little odd, but I'm gonna give you some ideas. I don't do these, I stole them from somebody else. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, German theologian, uh, big deal, wrote a number of books, uh, Cost of Discipleship, and, and another book called Life Together. And one of the things he sought to do is to make sure that, that God was at the forefront of his day, okay? He wanted to make sure that when he woke up every morning, that he was reminded constantly that today is the Lord's, all right? It is not my day. It's not about me. Today is God's day. And so one of the things he would try to do is he made sure the first thing he did when he got up, he gave the first word to God. First word was from God. He opened the Bible. First word was from God. And before he went to bed to put a cap on the day, the first word belongs to God and the last word belonged to God. And in doing this, what he did constantly in creating that mindset is that this is not mine. It is not about me. This day is God's. And he's completely shifting the perspective of what am I going to do today? How do I be the best me I can be versus how do I be this empty vessel for God? Another example, I heard from a pastor, um, and I tried this for a little while, uh, but I stopped after like twice, um, is what he would do is in an attempt to do the same thing, to start the day by going, today's not about me, it's about God, is instead of standing up when he got out of bed, he would slide onto his knees and start the day from a, from a position of submission. Today is not about me, today is about God. For some of you who have really high beds, it might be a little dangerous. Um, do it at your own risk. Jesus' life was marked by obedience. It was marked by humility. It was marked by self-renunciation and our lives are to be marked by the same. And again, knowing this is not enough, we have to do something. We need to change what we do and it is going to be hard because it goes against all of those selfish motives that we have inside of us. Barclay, a commentary tater says this. He says, Jesus draws men to himself that he may draw them to God. In the Philippian church, there were men whose aim was to gratify a selfish ambition. The aim of Jesus was to serve others. In the Philippian church, there were those whose aim was to focus men's eyes on themselves. The aim of Jesus was to focus men's eyes on God. Our job is not to draw attention to ourselves. Our job is to be united in the, in the common purpose of keeping the focus, keeping the aim, not on ourselves, not on glorifying ourselves, but glorifying God. 9, 10, and 11, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. For Paul, connecting back to this idea of joy, like I said, like a proud parent who's watching his kids learn, who's watching them grow, who's watching them mature, for him, it was his utmost joy to see them live this out. I'm gonna close with the idea that I believe fully that the best way for God to get glory out of you, again, is not necessarily for you to be the best you you can be, but rather for you to empty yourself, that you and I might be like miniature Christs running around throughout the world, that when people interact with us, they would, they would be interacting with Christ. When they hear us, they would be hearing Christ. I wanna close with a prayer, uh, and this prayer is taken from a song which is taken from a prayer of St. Patrick, okay? And this prayer is basically a prayer connected to a passage like this that, that, that Christ would be the one living through me, that it would be Christ that is in me, that it is Christ that people see. And so I just wanna pray that over us before we close in our worship service today. Um, the song is by a, a band called The Brilliance. Uh, it's called Christ Be With Me, uh, but I'm gonna change it to us because we're in a group. So would you bow your heads with me uh, and just receive this, this prayer? Christ be with us. Christ before us. Christ behind us. Christ within us, Christ below us, Christ above us, Christ be with us. 
at our right hand, at our left hand, as we lie down, as we rise up, as we stumble, as we fall down, Christ as we stand. Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of us. Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of us. Christ in every eye that sees us. Christ in every ear that hears us. Amen. Once again, I'm so glad you were all here to worship with us. Uh, I, we, we have anyone who would like prayer. We have people who would love to pray with you, uh, who would love to hear your requests and spend some time listening uh, to those things that you have to say and holding those problems for you. Uh, I hope you have a great Memorial Day weekend. Hopefully the sun comes out. I'm not sure if it's come out yet, but hopefully it comes out and you can enjoy yourselves. But as we go... May we, may we be reminded, okay, everything in us is, is, is selfish, is looking after for numero uno, okay? Everything within us is doing this. It is hard to set aside our status. It is hard to do this. It is hard to imitate Jesus. The idea is simple, but it is difficult. And so my hope and my prayer for each and every one of you is that we would all take baby steps, Okay, that each and every day we would take action, that we would be doing something that 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 shapes us and draws us more and more into the image of Christ, that when people see us, when people interact with us, that they would be interacting with Jesus Christ. May each and every one of us get out of the way. Amen.